Thank you very much, and thank you for the nice introduction. And it is always good to be back, not only in San Francisco, but at USF. And I have to say that uh, USF uh, Law School is where I decided I wanted, where I decided that I wanted to go to law school and where I wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, my mom was the first bilingual teacher uh, in the San Francisco Public Schools, one of the first in, in the junior highs, at James Lake Junior High. And this is when I was about 10 or 11. And she had the opportunity to come to USF on an internship program to get, to get a, her master's degree. So every day she'd pick me up after school and then she'd go to her class from four to six over at Campion Hall. And she'd, she'd seat us over there, my sister and I, and uh, we'd do our studies. She'd go to her class and she would grab dinner at the USF cafeteria. Go, but it was a great cafeteria at the time. Um, and then, we, then she'd go back for more work. So she was, she was working in school, becoming a school administrator, uh, raising uh, a couple of kids. And, 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 but it was the time that she was taking a law class on school law. And uh, so I'd go over to the USF Law Library to study. I thought, wow, this is great. All these cases, all this, this is great. So uh, this is, but this is really where I first saw law students and saw the law. And, and uh, so I have, I have a lot to thank uh, USF. USF for, uh, and also I think all of us, whether we're Catholic or not, Latinos, uh, the, just the, the work that the Jesuits uh, have, have done uh, in, in El Salvador and liberation theology of really bringing uh, God's work into, into reality uh, and having such an impact on the lives of so many refugees and immigrants coming to the United States is uh, certainly something uh, that, that I would be obliged to mention when, I'm, when I am here. Uh, at USF. Uh, and it really, it's also great to be around so many old friends and, and, and colleagues. Uh, Bill Hing, uh, for instance, I saw Bill Tamayo earlier, also from Lowell High School, uh, and a number, number of people who have fought the, f fought the fight, uh, whether it was back in as early as the late 70s uh, on saving the brothers and sisters preference, at that time the fifth preference, now it's the fourth preference for brothers and sisters of US citizens, uh, that the changes in immigration law over a period of years, stopping the raids back in the 80s, uh, and on and on and on. Uh, so many of you in San Francisco has really been like the capital of so much activism, not only in the Latino community, but in Asian Americans, among Filipinos and others. So I'm really pleased to, to be here. I share some thoughts on where we are going as a nation on immigration, uh, now with a tremendous change in Washington, D.C. And I, I will say that there has been much progress much progress over that period of time, but there are many, many more miles uh, left to go. Uh, but I think this is a time, this is a time where we will have the opportunity, but of course also the necessity uh, to make significant advancements on the way immigrants are treated in the United States and also the way we establish our laws and policies uh, that, that addresses them. Maldif, as you know, uh, was based uh, in San Francisco for many years. Uh, we're now based in, in, in Los Angeles. Uh, but we're really the law firm for the Latino community, uh, whether it is immigrant rights or whether it is voting rights for, for Latino citizens, uh, school uh, education issues and access. Uh, when I became president of general counsel in 2006, and uh, we had uh, brought in a new litigation director, Cynthia Valenzuela, uh, who many of you may know, uh, we really reoriented our litigation strategy around immigration, language, and education. Because the Latino success in those three areas will define Latino success uh, in the next 40 years, uh, in, in not only in California, but throughout the country. And of course, today, uh, while in the past, when, we, when Maldiv started, in fact, when Maldiv started, we didn't even talk about immigration. It was not an issue for the community uh, back then. I, I recently came across our first foundation proposal to, to the Ford Foundation. Uh, immigration was left in, in a footnote and in a paragraph because the major problems of, of, of Latinos then or Latino citizens were being discriminated against in education, in jury selection, in voting, in employment. So at that time, in the late 60s, uh, immigration was not a major issue for, for the community, uh, it, 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 although it became so uh, a after that time. But also back then, you could do Maldives work in about five or six states and say, well, you've covered the Latino community. Today, we are everywhere. And truly, every business, every family, and every community in the nation is affected by immigration. And again, not only Latino immigration, Asian immigration, European immigration. When I worked for Senator Simon, though growing up in San Francisco, I thought San Francisco was the most diverse city in the country. When I went to work for Senator Simon on the Senate Judiciary Committee, Senator Simon being from Illinois, at that time, there were only three senators 
on the Senate Immigration Subcommittee with Senator Simon from Illinois, Senator Kennedy, the chair from Massachusetts, and Senator Alan Simpson, who wrote the 86 Act um, from Wyoming. So it was a small subcommittee in the Senate. Why? Because nobody wanted to touch immigration, um, and it, because it was such a controversial issue at the time. Uh, but with, but this, in the state of Illinois, not only were not only were there immigration issues that the ones that we see here facing the Asian American community, Latino community, but Polish immigration, Irish immigration, Greek immigration. So that became a much much more diverse um, aspect. And it was not until the 1990 Act with the advent of the Immigrant Investor Program that started out well, but then really, uh, really floundered. Uh, but at that time, the, it, that was the first time that the central part and the southern parts of Illinois got interested in immigration. Usually immigration was a strictly solely one part of the state uh, issue. It became a statewide issue because uh, people who were in high unemployment areas and agricultural areas wanted immigrants to come in to invest in their farms, invest in their invest in their companies or create new companies and create new jobs. That was one of the requirements for the investor visa program. So truly today, na today immigration is a truly national issue and it must be a national issue and it must take uh, some uh, high level of importance uh, to this administration. As you know from, from, from the 2008 election results, uh, the Latino vote and immigration played dynamic roles uh, in both of the both of the nominations on the Republican side, Senator McCain was at least for a while he was took the position very much different from the rest of his colleagues who ran for president at the, the, the Tancredo and the and the Hunter wing. Uh, but as those candidates fall, fell off, he slipped into that he slipped into that mold. Uh, but Senator McCain won the Florida won the nomination based primarily on his uh, his uh, showing in Florida, where his, his margin of victory came from Cuban uh, re Republicans, not Anglo Republicans. On the Democratic side, Senator Clinton had strong support among Latinos, and her campaign probably would have stopped, except for the fact that Latinos kept bringing her back into the, back into the picture. Had she not lost, had she not, had she not won in Nevada, she would have been much more weakened. If she had not won in California, she would have been much more weakened. If she had not won in Texas, even the very last primary was in, was in Puerto Rico. She won that. So her, her the, 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 the Latino vote was important to keep the nomination going for a really long time. And then, of course, in the general election is where, is where contrary to some pundits and some, contrary to some in the community who thought that Senator Obama would not get support of Latinos, he got strong support from the Latino community, uh, record support, record turnout, lots of, lots of naturalization, lots of uh, voter registration, high turnout, four of the nine states that switch in the November 2008 election switch from Republican to Democrat were because of the Latino vote and were also because of the immigration issue being such a prominent issue within the community. And those states are Nevada, New Mexico, Colorado, and Florida. So as we look at immigration going forward, I think the administration is inspired by remembers uh, the, 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 how it got in and, 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 and the, types of, the types of dynamics that occurred in the 2008 election. And just going back recently over recent uh, immigration, immigration history from the time of the Sensenbrenner Bill. Sensenbrenner Bill, as you know, criminalized people who would assist others without checking first for their immigration status, and uh, it, it did among, uh, many other draconian things. But at that time, back in December of 2005, was it 2005, 2006 when it passed? The, the smart politics in Washington was you got to be for it. Some of the House Democratic, the House Democratic leaders said, if you're not going to vote for Sensenbrenner, we're not going to really have a need to invest in your, in your re-election campaign. That was the so-called smart politics back then. But because of the marches and the activism and a lot of the work that the Washington, D.C. Uh, immigrant advocates were able to do and doing it different in different ways but doing it together we changed the dynamic so that we had the marches uh, early the following year in, in, in March and starting in Chicago and then May every, everywhere else so then you had a Senate bill that took the comprehensive approach uh, that we at Mollif have supported and others have supported that deals with all sorts all immigration issues together of, in, of enforcement of legalization family reunification, reunification uh, guest workers and, and other provisions, dealing with them all in a package. Now it's very difficult. It's very difficult to get a bill passed like that. The history of, of, of passages of immigration 
laws have been that, that many administrations, many Congresses have tried to put everything together in one bill, uh, but it hasn't failed. The, the origins of the Simpson-Mazzoli law were that uh, it failed when everything was in it together. It, so they, they largely did illegal immigration enforcement in 86 with the legalization program, and then they took on the, the legal, the, the family and the employer sponsored in the 1990 Act. Trying to do it all together is difficult, but it, it, taking the comprehensive approach uh, w was essential. Now, a lot of what was in the, w what was in the first bill that passed the Senate, or even the bill that passes the Senate uh, in 2007, clearly were unacceptable to, to people in the community, uh, including Maldiv. The, the value and the attraction to uh, the Senate bill, of course, was that having a vehicle, having some action um, to get the bill, to get the legislative process moving forward into what people thought would be a more attractive and more sensitive and more sympathetic House of Representatives that could then make the kinds of changes in the same way that previous Houses and Senates had treated immigration would ultimately lead to comprehensive reform along the lines of, of, of what many people in this room would support. Now, that clearly didn't happen. The Senate uh, was not able to pass uh, immigration legislation in 2007. Uh, and then, w then what happened after that was exactly what we expected to happen, which was when, when, when Washington was clear that it could not handle the problem, then everybody else gets involved. The, the private actors, such as the Minutemen, and also the state and local government. So we saw the, the onslaught of anti-immigrant local ordinances started out in San Bernardino, uh, and Maldiv took that one on along with others in the community. Um, there was a, it was a renter's ordinance, uh, requiring renters to, uh, re requiring landlords to uh, file their, their leases with City Hall. Now, the, the San Bernardino had a new mayor uh, who wanted to have the San Bernardino Renaissance and try to do a lot of different things in that community. He knew and he said, it, this, if this passes, this will totally disrupt anything I want to do in my administration. The mayor, the mayor was against it, others were against it. Now, frankly, City Hall wouldn't know what to do with anybody's leases once they got them because City Hall, the local government, has no ability to access any kind of INS databases uh, in, or, in order to check anybody's immigration status. But it was done merely to intimidate and, and, and to, in, to, in, both to intimidate um, immigrants in the community, but also inflame the community. And after we debated the advocates on the other side uh, for a while, they made it clear what they really wanted. What they really wanted was to uh, either take on Plyler Vido or get around Plyler Vido by kicking people out of town so that the, so that the schools would not have any more Latino students. Uh, Plyler Vido, as you know, is the 1982 case allowing all students to go to public schools irrespective of their or their, or their parents' immigration status. So we knew that, that we knew in San Bernardino, if it passed in San Bernardino, it would spread across the country. What we didn't know was that even if it didn't pass in San Bernardino, it would still spread across the country through right-wing radio, through the internet. So you have places like Valley Park, Missouri, where the mayor said, well, I heard about it on the radio while I was driving my truck. I decided to have the council pass it that, that week, uh, or, or, or in other parts of the country. As you look at the cities and towns across the country where we have sued, uh, to, to, to defeat and nullify anti-immigrant ordinances or where we've been able to work with local communities to defeat them. There is no rhyme or reason, there's no pattern. It's not large, it's not large Latino population or small Latino population. It's not near the border, away from the border. It's just a scattershot of communities where local politicians think it's a cheap headline, it's, it's, it's a good way to get in the news. Either there, either there are immigrants in town and we can say, there's the problem, we're gonna get rid of them, or they can cast themselves as these great high-minded uh, local elected officials who are anticipating future problems in the community and therefore are doing something about it to prevent problems in, in their community. So we've had the advent as a result of not having federal immigration reform, we had uh, the, the rise of and the, the litigation over the anti-immigrant ordinances. So that brings us now into where is the administration going to go? And uh, as, as you know, the President Obama during the campaign promised to introduce uh, comprehensive immigration reform legislation uh, in 2009. And we believe that that will occur, that will happen. But again, it is introducing a bill. It doesn't say enacting a bill, it doesn't say what kind of bill that will look like. Now there are other there are various other pieces that are out there, including the Agricultural Jobs Act, 
uh, the DREAM Act for, for, for young people to be able to uh, go to college and, and, and adjust their status based upon uh, going just two years to a, to a community college or two years out of a four-year school. Uh, there are other my more, more, more limited uh, and targeted pieces of legislation, but the big piece of legislation we do expect to have something introduced in 2009. And, and then, notwithstanding the, the current uh, focus on, on the economy, which of course is, is, is very important and very large to, to focus on that, and after all, the, uh, just for the, the Latino unemployment rate is, is, is over 9%. The nation, national rate is high enough, over 7, it's 7.2, 7.4. Latino rate is even higher. For Latino teens, the unemployment rate is 24%. If you look at foreclosures, they're focused in California, uh, Nevada, Arizona, and Florida, states where, where many immigrants and many, many Latinos are. So we have these, these major, major issues, uh, and it is unclear right now how much the, the consideration uh, and, and discussion and enactment of, of reforms in those areas will delay immigration reform. But in a sense, that's all right, because it will give the administration some time to do certain things that they can do without the consent of Congress, without, uh, without actually having to, the need for legislation. Now, the only way to adjust that people's status, uh, with, some limited, with some limited exceptions, uh, the only way to really do that on a broad way is through legislation, so it will require uh, President and Congress to get together on this, but in the meantime, there are about eight or nine things that uh, that we are uh, we at Maldef and, and many other organizations are calling upon uh, the administration to consider and to, and, and, and to do. Uh, first of all, is in the enforcement strategy. Right now, as many of you know, uh, the enforcement strategy is such that uh, the Immigration Service or ICE will. Uh, as they are looking for one person with a final order of deportation, will go to that per the last known address for that person. Uh, typically, it's wrong, which is because of the, the way uh, people move and the way the, the way the uh, the way the ICE uh, ICE records are. Uh, but they will go out, and they, the ICE takes it takes the position that as they are looking for one particular person in one particular place, they have the ability to ask and detain and check for people's immigration status. Anybody else who lives in that apartment lives in that apartment complex, lives, lives in that house, shopping in that mall, working in that store, or, or in the general area. So it's not surprising that they end up getting more people that way than the person they're actually looking for. In many, in many instances, they pick up a lot of people, 70, 75, 100 or more, and the person they're actually looking for has long, has long gone. That is a strategy that is unnecessary. It's not done. Uh, if, if, if the police are looking for a rapist, they don't check everybody else out. They look for the type of person who they're looking for. The, they look for the person they're looking for with the description of that person. Uh, when they go after the, the people on Wall Street, they don't go after, after every last person on Wall Street. They go look for Bernie Madoff. They go look for uh, so, some of the others. Uh, so this is, a, this is an enforcement strategy that, um, or they don't, you're right. Um, <laughs> This is an enforcement strategy that, that is basically limited to immigration, and that is one that, that just preys upon the fears of people in, our, in, in, in the community. At Malta, we have a parent school partnership program around, in, um, centered around our various regional offices around the country. And oftentimes, people in this parent school partnership program, we have our programs at night for parents, get them more engaged in their children's education. They will say, you know, I really don't want to be out. I don't want to take one more trip outside the house. Uh, because maybe driving uh, driving without a license, or they just they just get their fears of being picked up. I know if about three or four months ago, maybe it was a little bit longer, uh, over in Berkeley, uh, one of the uh, one of the elementary schools, uh, there was a fear um, because somebody and a, a grandmother of a student was picked up a couple blocks away uh, from uh, from the school. The school put out a notice saying there's going to be a raid at, at there's going to be an ice raid uh, this afternoon don't pick up your kids or, or, or find some other way to pick up your kids. Now, as it turned out, that wasn't happening, uh, but just because of the fear out there, uh, it, it, it doesn't take much to get, to get that type of, that type of, of real, real concern uh, going on in the community. It's our job at Maldiv, and, and, and I think all of our job is to try to reduce the fear wherever, wherever it can be. So we're often, there was a, there was a call about a, a concert at, at uh, at uh, I think the Disney Center in, in, in LA about a year ago, we'd gotten a call saying on Saturday night, 
ICE is going to be there to, to raid the concert. Um, didn't happen. There was no, there was no uh, activity planned, uh, but we tried to get the word out. No, the, try, to get, try to separate fact, uh, fact from fear. So the, but this whole enforcement strategy really lends itself uh, to making people scared uh, unnecessarily and, and inappropriately. Similarly to that, uh, there is this, uh, the greater use of local law enforcement. So on the first one, I think uh, on the first one, I think the administration can change the way uh, change the way that that uh, um, there change its enforcement strategy. Uh, there was a raid up in, in in Bellingham, Washington, just this week, and the the new head of DHS is really reviewing exactly what has gone on there. Uh, so that she's asked for about ten different in ten different areas of, of ICE operations. Uh, reviews uh, leading to leading to I think some changes. A uh, second one is the use of local law enforcement. This is one that has really not only uh, caused a lot of fear, uh, but it has also made everybody everybody less safe. Not just not just the people who who, who may be picked up. Uh, there's a greater increase in racial profiling, greater e use of immigration laws to pick people up. Not only by the ICE a, ICE uh, the, rather, the uh, police departments that have an MOU with ICE. Uh, this is the 287G. It, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it, it allows uh, local police officers to enforce immigration laws if they have a specific contract with, with the immigration service. But what we have seen is that when the issue comes up, other police departments and uh, police officers who aren't trained under the ICE, under, under the MOU program and the, under the 287G uh, program are uh, then given the green light to enforce immigration laws. So if this, this has occurred, we're told, in the state of Virginia, where the state highway patrol, uh, while Prince William County is one focus, other counties and the state highway patrol are also, uh, we're also hearing uh, that there's racial profiling going on, immigration law enforcement going on. The consequence of having police involved with local law enforcement is that <coughs> People are much less likely to cooperate with police, uh, to report crimes as, as victims or others, and the perpetrators out there know it. In Maryland and Virginia, uh, Latinos are being targeted. It's called amigo shopping. I live in Pasadena. Uh, the police have identified a, a, a crime wave called SOM crimes, SOC on Mexicans. And they said there were 75 of these crimes back in 2005 or 2006 where the typical pattern is uh, a, a, a person leaving, leave, getting off work late at night. They're in a cash economy uh, because they're not allowed, allowed to access the, the traditional banking system. They've got cash on them, uh, and, and the perpetrators are able to, to threaten them. Well, if you go to the police, the police are just going lead to you, lead you to deportation. We've had since instances in Costa Mesa, California, where ISIS put somebody in the local jail uh, where an individual was uh, U turned on his bicycle. So at one point he was going the wrong way on his bike. He was stopped by the police. Didn't have any ID. They took him in, took him into the to, into the uh, into into the jail house, and the ice person then uh, ran him through um, uh, their own database. So these are. Meanwhile, there are other people who uh, have final orders of deportation, have committed crimes that make them deportable, uh, and they are not yet picked up. Uh, but by ICE. So we're trying to re, we would suggest reorient, one of the things that the administration can do is reorient it away from local police, away from uh, people who are just simply uh, working or, or living in the community into those who, who have committed uh, crimes that make them deportable or who, or who have committed crimes and were already uh, without authorization. Another area that the administration can take up uh, leading to immigration reform is the Compion decision, reversing that. Uh, as many of you know, the Attorney General, the M Mukasey, uh, issued an, uh, in, an opinion uh, shortly before the end of the Bush administration uh, that uh, allowed for or, or, or disallowed uh, in ineffective counsel as a grounds for appeal uh, in, in immigration cases, and said there is no there is no right to counsel in, in immigration cases. This is one that will have serious impact on on, on the a accurate and, and and speedy disposition of immigration cases, and this is something that. Uh, Attorney General Holder has said during his um, during his confirmation hearing that he would that he would take a look at uh, also in the area of of, of uh, 287 G's 
the, the, the local uh, law enforcement. Uh, because of the um, ability of currently uh, both federal as well as, as well as local law enforcers to, to use immigration status as a proxy and use a Latino appearance as a proxy uh, for, reasons to pro for reasons to question somebody, but we really need the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice really to look into this and look into this closely. Beyond that, uh, we've got a sheriff in the, in the state of Arizona, Maricopa County, Arizona, who's just run roughshod over the rights of, of not only unauthorized immigrants, but, but, but all Latinos uh, in, the, in the state, in, in his county. Uh, you know, back in 1961, when Robert Kennedy was the Attorney General, uh, Southern sheriffs thought the law didn't apply to African Americans, thought the Constitution didn't apply to African Americans. And we need today, I think we have today with Eric Holder and the person who's coming into the Civil Rights Division, have people who will say to Southern sheriffs, main, main, namely Joe Arpaio in Maricopa County, that this conduct is wrong, this conduct has to stop. So this is another area in, in, in the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department that immigration uh, is uh, can loom large and ought to loom large and high on their priority list. Uh, hate crimes as well. I, I mentioned the situation with the SOM crimes in Pasadena and Amigo shopping. Right now we have a record number of hate crimes against Latinos. The, the numbers are under the FBI's hate crime statistics report issued every year demonstrates a, a rapid increase in the percentages and numbers of, of Latinos in national origin based uh, crimes, uh, hate crimes. Uh, and this is as a direct result of a lot of the anti-immigrant animosity and rhetoric that we see in here on a daily basis. We've had a killing in Pennsylvania, two killings in New York, and almost on a daily basis we get reports saying people are, are attacked for speaking Spanish on, in, on the sidewalk, or, or, or um, the man in Florida was mad at his wife and he said, I'm gonna go out and, I'm gonna go out and um, kill a Mexican or a Puerto Rican. So he knifed, he knifed a, a, a Latino. But these, these are, I, I really not want to exaggerate, but these are instances that we hear very, very frequently. So we need hate crime statistics, uh, hate crime uh, enforcement, greater enforcement. There's a hate crime enhancement law uh, that has been pending in Congress. We, we hope that it will be passed uh, later this year. That will give the Justice Department the ability to uh, bring hate crimes prosecutions where a local prosecutor may not for any number of reasons. Uh, or and also give, give, really give more resources to preventing crimes and really increase community education. What this also means is that whether it's the Department of Homeland Security or the Department of Justice or the Department of Education for English language learners, what we really need is somebody in the White House who will, so that the Department of Homeland Security is not the only agency that will respond on immigration issues. When I worked at the, when I worked at the Clinton in, in the Clinton administration, typically INS was the default agency for everything related to immigration. Fortunately, at the time, the Department of Justice had uh, INS within it, and we were able to. Those of us in the Civil Rights Division were able to. Uh, the Attorney General would say, "Well, what does civil rights think of this?" Uh, but we need somebody at the White House who can coordinate the Department of Education's role, um, the, the, the DHS, Department of Justice and other agencies that have an impact on immigration so that the administration can really be speaking as, as one and demonstrate to the American people that it knows where it wants to go in immigration and then has the capacity to do it. If those things can be done, we will then have a better, uh, better legislative atmosphere, a better uh, political atmosphere for the tough road ahead on comprehensive immigration re reform. Finally, I want to mention one other point and I really want to open this up for, you, for your questions. Uh, one other point, and that is on, that is on appointments, uh, both appointments to the Circuit Courts of Appeal. The Circuit Courts, whether it's the Ninth Circuit here or the Second Circuit in New York and some of the other circuits, are dominated by immigration cases. Because of the Ashcroft reforms uh, to immigration judges and the Board of Immigration Appeals, more and more cases go directly to the Circuit Courts for appeal. And when they are appealed, you look at, you look at the composition of the Circuit Courts of Appeal, when the, when the senators or the White House have been picking judges for the circuit courts, they don't typically say, well, the big part of your docket's gonna be immigration cases. What do you know about immigration law? The, the circuit courts of appeal judges don't, have not come with much immigration background and, and the, their dockets are dominated by immigration. So we wanna see some really examination of how 
people who know who people who know immigration immigrant communities have a better shot at getting on the circuit courts of appeal and finally uh, because all everything is local uh, the US attorney right here in San Francisco Joe Russiniello uh, has been anathema on immigration issues and issues facing the Latino community not only during his current tenure but previously when he was appointed uh, by President Reagan in the early 1980s uh, he got from the San Francisco registrar voters all the list of people who voted in Spanish or voted in Chinese and then ran it through the INS database which was wrong and inaccurate and out of date and he said oh look at all these illegal aliens voting well it turns out not one of them was an undocumented immigrant not one of them was a non-citizen and he is still the US attorney and I'm very proud that uh, a number of members of the Board of Supervisors and a lot of people from the, from the uh, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, Phil Huang and the Asian Law Caucus and Chinese for Affirmative Action, a lot of La Rasta lawyers in San Francisco have all gone to the Board of Supervisors and, and asked Senator Boxer and asked the President to um, fill, get a new U.S. Attorney in very soon. Uh, that's certainly appropriate. The Board of Supervisors has a resolution uh, next week introduced by Supervisor Campos and a number of other supervisors that will also join in that, join in that fight and that's something that Maldif uh, certainly supports. Uh, so there are a lot of things going on in immigration, uh, and I know all of you are uh, active in it and, and really are at the front line, so I want to thank you for all your efforts. Uh, we will continue to do what we do at Maldiv, uh, and we do look for some better days ahead in 2009 and 2010. Thanks very much. go ahead and open this up to questions from the audience and if you raise your hand the mic will come to you and while that is happening um, raise your hand higher he'll bring you a mic do you think John what about um, border patrols is there also anything on the agenda for looking at the way that the current border is patrolled so that it's done in a more humane way well that, that has to be that has to be on the agenda I don't know I don't know particularly what plans they have but there is a recognition there is a recognition with the increase, the really ramp up of numbers of, of, of Border Patrol, what is really of concern uh, is both the, the new officers who are there, and they're, they're by, by the nature of their work, they're pretty much on their own. There's some of those miles between one and the next one. The supervision, I think what's really, in any kind of law enforcement operation, the supervisors are as important as the line people. And that I think that there needs to be some real recognition on that. Uh, the Inspector General at the at Department of Homeland Security uh, has been very busy over the last few years on, on board patrol misconduct. Thanks for the great overview. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on what role Secretary Hilda Solis might have on immigration issues from the Department of Labor. Yes, I think we now have, finally, it took a while to get her confirmed, but do we now have someone who could not be a better uh, person in, in the administration uh, to take on the, uh, take on those issues, uh, whether it is uh, workplace safety at OSHA, uh, immigrant workers are in the most dangerous and difficult jobs in our society. The industrial death rates for Latinos is very and, and immigrants in general is very very high. Uh, so I think she will uh, be the one around the cabinet table who will have a voice in those issues. I'm glad I'm, I'm, I didn't mention DOL, but I should have. Uh, and also on, on a lot of the other issues, uh, whether it's the Women's Bureau or whether it is wa wage gaps and, and uh, the many, many issues uh, in terms of just general enforcement that I think will have a, a very strong effect on how the administration as a whole deals with immigration. Yes, I, I just had a, uh, a comment. I want to thank you for coming. I was in the other overflow room listening to your uh, <coughs> keynote address. And yesterday, uh, I'm from Sacramento, my name is Francisco Dominguez, and yesterday there was a protest at the police station, actually at the, at the jail, because an immigrant worker was killed last week. He was put in jail for drunk driving, and <clears throat> they were gonna hold him for ICE. So, but his first night at the jail, he was beaten to death and actually strangled. And yesterday we had a protest at the, at the uh, at the jail and the young man's uh, family came to the protest out in front. So <clears throat> we don't really know exactly what happened inside the jail, uh, <clears throat> but this was a man that was, a young man was 26 years old and he lasted one night in the jail. And they put him in, in a jail cell with a very violent 
person. And so I, didn't, I just wanted to, this is probably the latest death that has happened and probably is a hate crime. Thank you. Thanks, um, that was really informative. I, I was wondering, um, John, what you thought enforcement measures would look like under the Obama administration, because it's clearly still going to be a priority um, but uh, right now we've seen, you know, up until now we've seen a lot of raids. So what is it going to look like um, in the next four years, enforcement, immigration enforcement? I have to say I wish I knew the answer. I, I think the, the reading the tea leaves, we, a, a lot of, I know a number of people in this room and uh, around the country had a very good set of meetings with the Obama-Biden transition team just on, on, on this very issue. Uh, Tina Quayer, who teaches at Stanford Law School, uh, played a major role uh, on the Obama transition team. So they've heard uh, from people as, as to what types, what, what, are, what are the uh, overbearing types of enforcement, what are, what are, the, what are the priorities for enforcement. Uh, it's unclear how, it's unclear what we're gonna see. Uh, I understand that the new person from, uh, who's gonna be in charge of the policy and planning at the Department of Homeland Security, Esther Oliveria, who used to work for Senator Kennedy for many years on immigration issues. So I think we'll have, uh, what I do know is we'll have an open door, we'll have access to people who will understand uh, the type of situations that you just described of the man in Sacramento. And also the, at, at, the, at the Civil Rights Division of Justice, the new, uh, looks to be the new head of the Civil Rights Division, a former Maldef attorney. So I think we will have people over there who will be much more responsive, clearly much more responsive uh, than, than the previous eight years. Hi, John. Thanks. Uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned comprehensive immigration reform and the administration promising to introduce some sort of CIR bill this year. It, but you also alluded to the DREAM Act and the possibilities of act jobs. As you know, across the country, the DREAM Act students have a very strong network and they're clamoring to push DREAM Act now sooner rather than later. But they're being told by Many people, the usual suspects in D.C. who are in favor of comprehensive immigration reform, don't push for the DREAM Act. Let's push for comprehensive immigration reform because if we only get the DREAM Act passed, it, 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 it'll mean that we won't be able to get comprehensive immigration reform passed. And I'm wondering how you feel about that and whether or not what the students are being told is accurate or if you think the students should go for it for the DREAM Act? What are your views on that? I think it's a little bit of both and now being based in Los Angeles I'm, I'm, I'm less in tune with what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis in, in Washington. Uh, I, I think that that is a, a the, the message about we need to get everybody in the same bill to go forward makes sense when we're talking to the high-tech people. It makes sense when we're talking to the, the agriculture and some, some of the other industries uh, because if those industries are not at the table, uh, then, then they'll get theirs, everybody else will get theirs, and then the, the major work left to be done, they'll find, people will find reasons not to do it. I think, uh, I think for, for the students piece, we got close last year. I, th I think we got close to over 50 votes in the Senate for it. Uh, I think it probably could pass on its own. And I also think it probably would not uh, take away from, from, from the cause to get the bigger package. Uh, so I think I, I, I will punt on in terms of where it would come down on it, but I think the case we made that students should go forward and push and continue to push, and, and all, the, all of those of us who have advocated for the students should go, should go push for those changes. The other kind of change that we need is, is on a provision from the 96 Act uh, that has been used to challenge AB 540 here in California, uh, and uh, the AB 540 is the, is, is the law for uh, in, waiving out of state tuition for people who've grown up here and gone to our, gone to our high schools. Their parents have paid into the paid into the system. Uh, allow them to go to go to, go to UC and, and the Cal States and uh, community colleges uh, as 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 real California residents. So on that, and that is coming up before the California Supreme Court, Maldif and a number of groups. Are, are on that along along with the state to defend AB 540, uh, but I think a change in the, that federal law would allow uh, the AB 540s to go unfettered 
uh, and we think we're going to win anyway, but it, it probably uh, that also would be a fix. Uh, so I would say that everybody needs to keep pushing, and I think we could sort out the timing timing later on. Right now, everything is focused on everything is focused on on, on the economy and the bailout and the stimulus and all of that. So uh, that that is going to exhaust the legislative agenda for for a good period of time. Do we have time for one more question? Okay, so we have time for one more question. Great. Can you talk about the detention centers? Great question. You're here. Can you talk about the detention centers? So when someone is picked up in a raid, say a, work, uh, a workplace or an at-home raid, and taken to a detention center that may or may not be where they live, may or may not be by their community, may or may not be by their attorney, mm -hmm. taken mm -hmm. someplace, we're just beginning to hear a lot about the oppressive and brutal conditions at those detention centers. Is that something that you uh, have anything to contribute on? I think you've, you've stated what's gone on well. I mean, in, in and I know ICE has moved people. There was uh, the Swift Company raids. It was really, really clear they were moving people from uh, the Midwest all the way to Georgia, where they have some of the most stringent immigration judges um, in, that are in Georgia. And they said, well, we took them there because we had, we had bed space. Well, I can't imagine they didn't have bed space anywhere between Iowa and Georgia. So uh, we've, got, we've got problems with the conditions. Uh, we've got problems with the lease space. Uh, for whatever reason, DHS has been very unwilling to uh, be an active customer and, and, and tell, their, tell the, the local facilities that they use they have to have some basic, basic levels of basic standards. So uh, I think all of that is going to be o overhauled. And again, there's, the, there's the, the synchronization between the Department of Justice that has, that has jurisdiction over the Civil Rights of Institutionalized Persons Act and Department of Homeland Security, which is paying the bills uh, for, for the local enforcement actually, and, and in their own facilities, actually running them. So that's going to be one that once everybody gets into place, that's one that's going to be uh, very, very important, uh, both to the administration, but also to members of Congress who are hearing more and more and more about the conditions that are out there. Great. Well, thank you very much, John. Thank you very much.